Hi everyone and welcome to our review on enzymes. What we're going to be doing in this video then is a couple of spec statements for us today from the enzyme section. First one, looking at the role of our enzymes in terms of the cellular and whole organism level and how these enzymes affect both structure and function. And the second one is looking at those intracellular and extracellular reactions and the role of enzymes within them. And we'll have a look at a few specific examples there, catalase, amylase and trypsin. OK, if you think back to GCSE, I'm hoping that we all remember this phrase that enzymes are biological catalysts. Well, what does that mean? Biological is all to do with our living things. So that's our living organisms. And a catalyst basically speeds up the rate of reaction. So what we have is something that's going to speed up the rate of reaction inside living organisms. And the way that they do this, and hopefully you remember this from GCSE, is that they lower the activation energy. And if we think back to our GCSE chemistry knowledge, hopefully we remember that the activation energy is the minimum energy required to actually start a reaction. One of these other key facts that we should know about our enzymes is that come the end of this reaction they are catalyzing, they will be unchanged. So there's no difference to our enzyme at the beginning to the end. They remain completely unchanged. And because of that, we can actually only require a very small amount of enzyme that can then catalyze the formation of lots of product. So we don't need vast quantities like vats of these enzymes. Small amounts can make a lot of product. A new phrase we need to know for A-level, turnover number. Whenever we talk about the turnover number, quite simply, this is just the number of reactions that an enzyme can catalyze per second. So it's going to be an actual numerical value. Obviously, the higher it is, then that means it can catalyze more reactions each second. So we make more product each second. We can find a couple of different types of question that come in are based on this around the mathsy part of our exams, because we know there's going to be maths based questions on each of these papers. So first one on the left, which enzyme would catalyze more reactions in five minutes? And this is basically asking you to show your knowledge of standard form. So hopefully we can look if A is a turnover number of one times 10 to the power of three and B is a turnover number of 10,000, then the correct answer there is B because 10,000 is greater than one times 10 to the power of three. Option number two for our little maths ones, how many reactions would be catalyzed in one hour by an enzyme with a turnover number of 4.6 times 10 to the power of four? So remember, the turnover number, that 4.6 times 10 to the power 4, that is per second. So if we're actually looking to see how many reactions are going to be catalyzed in an hour, if that's one second, then if we think about how many seconds are in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. So that gives us 3,600 seconds in an hour. And then all you've got to do is our 4.6 times 10 to the power 4 times by 3,600. And whatever that answer is, is going to be your number of reactions catalyzed. Obviously, things to remember at this point is you are going to need a calculator for your biology papers. Please don't turn up without one because there are going to be math based questions on these papers somewhere. And the last thing you want to be trying to do is some kind of mental math in an A-level biology exam. Get your scientific calculators, get used to using them so you are going to be able to do these very easily. So what affects the rate of our enzymes then? Again, we're going back to GCSE knowledge here, folks. What we do know is that temperature and pH are going to affect our enzymes. Now, what we can actually find in the enzymes that we find in living organisms is they're a little bit special in the fact that the enzymes we find in living organisms will function at these lower temperatures and a neutral pH in many cases. Not all. We will look at examples of those that don't later. But why is that important to a living thing? Well, if we've got enzymes able to function these lower temperatures, neutral pHs, etc., then we can have a high rate of reaction 
without needing conditions like really high temperatures that would actually cause harm to the organism. Go so logical. If we are talking about enzyme that only works when we've got a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, that's not going to sort of work wonders for our membranes, for example. You heat up cell membranes to 70 degrees, they're going to start to break down. So that wouldn't be great. So the fact that these enzymes work at lower temperatures, neutral pH, low pressures, etc., means they're able to work in our living organisms without causing harm. Again, back to the basics. Enzymes are proteins. This is a lovely little link back to our biological molecule section where we were looking at protein structure. So where we do these bits, remember, look for those links. We are talking about a protein. This means all of that work that we did previously on proteins, that can come into play on an enzyme question. So don't just think, oh, this question is only about enzymes. You could have a part C all about protein structure in there. Now, if we've got a protein, hopefully we do remember that when we go tertiary structure, then that means we have this three dimensional shape. And one of the key parts of our enzyme is our good old friend, the active site. Now, the shape of that active site is specific to a particular substrate, and it's actually only a very small number of amino acids that make this up. And you see there, six to 10 usually. Now, what we find is the tertiary structure of that active site must be complementary to the substrate to allow it to form that enzyme substrate complex. If they are not complementary to one another, the substrate can't bind to the active site, it can't catalyze the reaction. So that means each of these enzymes is specific for a particular substrate. And that's that whole idea of the lock and key hypothesis, which we're going to look at in more detail in a later video. We should be aware of things that can change this active site then. And again, this is going to have some of those cross topic links coming in. The first one is our friend mutations. You heard about mutations at GCSE. When it comes to module six, then you are going to learn about mutations in more detail. Now, mutation is obviously a change in that base sequence. Therefore, if we change the base sequence in the gene that codes for our enzyme, we could end up changing the amino acids we are coding for. In that instance, different amino acids, different tertiary structure, different shape of the active site, no longer complementary. You will get more of these links as we build on this knowledge from the early part of the course into that year 13 topic. Second one, temperature changes, and our third one, pH changes. Now you will have looked at temperature and pH in a lot more detail at GCSE. You should be able to sketch those quick graphs that we looked at, and we are going to be looking at them in more detail in a future video as well. This is just our quick reminder of what could change the active site. What we now need to do is move on to that second spec statement, intracellular and extracellular enzymes. First one, intracellular. If we break that word down, intra just means inside, cellular, cell. So we're talking about enzymes that are inside the cell. So intracellular kind of says it on the tin. Now, what we actually find is these intracellular enzymes are not only catalyzing the reactions within the cell, but also within those organelles of the cell. Link back to our earlier work on the organelles inside our cells there. Now, what we will find is that some of these reactions taking place inside our cell form part of a metabolic pathway. When we talk about metabolic pathways, this is basically where we have a sequence of steps. And the product from one step is then going to be used in the next. So if we have a look at the little diagram at the bottom here, first of all, then what we can see is we've got our first enzyme, which is that gray circle with kind of a little bit of a triangle coming out of it, like a little Pac-Man shape. And then our green bit is our first substrate. So what we can see is as that first substrate binds, we make our first product, which is actually going to then be the substrate for enzyme two. The product of that reaction becomes a substrate for our third enzyme. And then eventually we will get to the end product. 
But key thing here, each step has its own enzyme. We can see there's three in this example, and they produce a product that becomes the substrate for the next step. One word we should be aware of here is the word metabolite which just refers to our reactants, products and intermediates. So any of those we can just refer to as a metabolite in these metabolic pathways. We have two types of pathway that occur within our cells. We have catabolic and anabolic. Now, these basically tell us what's happening in this pathway. So in our catabolic pathway, this is where the metabolites are being broken down into smaller molecules and they release energy. If we go anabolic pathways, this is where we're going to actually make larger molecules from these smaller ones and it uses energy. How can you remember that? Well, in our everyday life and probably some of our PSHE education you've had lower down the school, you may have heard about our anabolic steroids. What are anabolic steroids all to do with? They help us build muscle. So if we're talking about anabolic steroids building muscle, anabolic pathways building larger molecules. So you can make that little link in your head using something that may be more familiar to you as that mental link there. We needed to know a specific example of an intracellular enzyme and that specific example is catalase. How do we know it's an enzyme? Because of course it ends in ASE. Now catalase is incredibly important because it's actually going to break down hydrogen peroxide. Now hydrogen peroxide is actually produced inside our cells and we need to get rid of it because it's quite toxic. You don't want to bathe your cells in hydrogen peroxide. That's bad. If we break it down, then we end up with just water and oxygen, harmless things. So our catalase increases the rate of that reaction of hydrogen peroxide becoming just water and oxygen. And it does this really quick. You can see its turnover number there. Six million of these reactions will occur each second per catalase. OK, so we've got a very high turnover number here, which means we're protecting ourselves from damage of that hydrogen peroxide. What is catalase? Well, it's made up of these four polypeptide chains, going back to our protein structures there, and a heme group with iron. So think back to your work on proteins. We have four polypeptide chains in the structure. That means that we have quaternary structure, because obviously primary is just your sequence of the amino acids, secondary, alpha helix or beta pleated sheet, tertiary, three-dimensional structure, quaternary, more than one polypeptide chain coming in. And we then have a prosthetic group, which is our heme group here. So we've got a quaternary structure with a prosthetic group. Where do we find the catalase? It's inside these little vesicles called peroxisomes. And you will find these in eukaryotic cells. Now, when we talk about catalase, we're being a bit general when we just say catalase because it's not just an individual catalase for every living thing. We actually have different forms of catalase for different organisms because they have different optimum temperatures and different optimum pHs, depending on the conditions they're going to work in. So still going to be catalyzing that breakdown of our hydrogen peroxide, but different forms work at different temperatures and pHs. That leads us nicely on to our extracellular enzymes. Again, break the word down. Extra just means outside and cellular cell. So this is outside the cell. When we talk about our extracellular enzymes, then these are made inside the cell, but they then get secreted to where they're going to act. So these are not acting inside the cell. We make them in the cell, then we secrete them to somewhere else that they have their action. And a good example of an organism that does this, something we've encountered before, is good old fungi. So the fungi actually secrete those hydrolytic enzymes. So hydrolytic lysis is, of course, our splitting. And hydro is using hydrolysis. So our hydrolytic enzymes 
they're going to actually break down some kind of substance. So the fungi are going to secrete them onto the surface, they break down whatever they've been secreted onto, and then the fungi absorb the products of our reaction. We need to know about two examples from our spec. First one is amylase. Now amylase is produced in your salivary glands and it's going to digest starch into maltose. So again, where have we heard about starch before? Earlier biological molecules work. We spent a bit of time looking at its structure and its function, etc. We looked at its nature and how obviously the structure and the function tie together. Make sure you can do that now. And we also looked at maltose where we were having a look at obviously our carbohydrate section. So what we find is our amylase is going to digest starch into maltose. So our polysaccharide into a disaccharide. Now, what we actually find is in terms of where we make amylase, other than the salivary glands, also in the pancreas. And if it's made in the pancreas, rather than ending up obviously in our mouth, because that's where the salivary glands is going to deposit, the stuff from the pancreas goes into your small intestine. Still going to be breaking down starch into our maltose, but obviously a different region. In both cases, it's made somewhere and secreted to a different location where it has its action. Second example of our extracellular enzyme is trypsin. Now trypsin is again made in the pancreas, but trypsin is a protease enzyme. Now, if we remember from GCSE, our protease enzymes are going to actually digest our proteins and they're gonna have their action in the small intestine here. So trypsin being made in our pancreas, secreted then into the small intestine where it will break down the proteins into our amino acids. So the proteins will then be broken down into the amino acids that we can absorb and utilize in other ways. Hopefully you found today's video useful as our little introduction to our enzymes. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can see when the next video goes up. And of course, remember to check out the website because that has other resources that may be useful to you as well.